Okay, good afternoon, good morning, or shall we say ohayo gozaimasu for our colleagues in Japan. This is Mark Arnold, Senior Vice President of Marketing with Zap Surgical. Welcome and thanks for joining us today for our sixth webinar as part of the Winter SRS webinar series. Held every Thursday between now and May 13, this new series does include 12 talks over 12 weeks. If you haven't already, I encourage everyone to visit the srswebinars.com website to review not only the upcoming presentations, but also register to view recordings of prior webinars as well. And one item of business before we get started, if you'd like to submit typewritten questions at any time during today's talk, you can do so by using the Q&A button found in the Zoom console. And time permitting, your questions will be addressed at the end of today's presentation. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. John Adler. Dr. Adler is the CEO and co-founder of Zap Surgical, inventor of the CyberKnife system, and Professor Emeritus of Neurosurgery and Radiation Oncology at Stanford University. Dr. Adler. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you for the audience for joining us today. I'm delighted to introduce uh, today's uh, guest speaker, um, Dr. Uh, Jun Itani, uh, MD, PhD, who is uh, Chief of Radiation Oncology at the National Cancer Center Hospital in uh, Tokyo, Japan. Um, <clears throat> under Dr. Itami's leadership, uh, the National Cancer Center Hospital has really built one of the world's greatest state-of-the-art radiation therapy centers in the world, really exploring the frontiers of modern radiation technology and working with a broadcast, a, a wide cast of radiation oncologists and uh, medical physicists, pushing the frontiers of what radiation oncology can do today. Um, and uh, under his leadership, they have built an amazing experience uh, in the area of choroidal melanoma. And today, uh, Dr. Itami is going to be speaking about uh, stereotactic radiotherapy for choroidal melanoma. So uh, without further ado, uh, good morning, Dr. Itami, and I look forward to your presentation. And again, I remind the audience, uh, please pose any questions you want by the uh, little question, uh, raise your hand or propose even better a Q&A question, far end of the bottom of your screen. Dr. Itami. Yes, thank you, Professor Adra, for inviting me and giving me such a great opportunity to talk about the colloidal melanoma. I would like to share my slide at first. Uh, can you see already my slide? See it very well, looks perfect. Yes, moment, I would like to go to the side show. Yes, uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening of the audience. I'm Dr. Tami, a radiation oncologist from the National Cancer Center Hospital Japan. Uh, I would like to talk today a little bit different topics than the other intracranial tumors. I, uh, I would like to talk about the choroidal melanoma stereotactic irradiation, uh, which is uh, the choroidal melanoma is movable even after the fixation of the scar. Uh, so it's a big problem to stop the prevent the moving of the eyeball during the radiation and how much we should take the PTV, CTV margins. So this is so uh, melanoma can occur anywhere in the uber membrane. Uber membrane is consisted of three parts that is so iris and also ciliary body uh, and colloidal membrane, which is shown in this diagram with a velvet layer. And so iris melanoma is very easy to be diagnosed because if we can, we see the iris or the pupil of the patient, then it will be a little bit blackened. So it is very easy to diagnose and very easy to operate. So it has the best prognosis. Uh, in contrast, the ciliary body melanoma, which uh, occurs uh, not so often, but it has a very worse prognosis because it so tends to metastasize very early to the liver and other body, body parts. And colloidal melanoma, which is uh, which lies under retina, it has an intermediate prognosis between these two entities. 
So I'm uber melanoma is mainly treated by radiation therapy. Uh, in 1970s, it was operated. In the patient or the patient of uber melanoma underwent inoculation of eyeball. But now they want to be uh, treated with conservative method. So the patient have some uh, page complaints of the patient is a floaters or so visual field contraction or visual acuity reduction. And ophthalmologists do the fundoscopic examination, which disclose the, in the left view, we can see some tumors approaching to the optic disc, and it is not so greatly pigmented. But in the right one, the tumor is uh, obviously uh, pigmented, uh, but it does not encroach to the optic disc, but uh, some fovea uh, is so uh, near to the tumor. So uh, the, ophthalmo the ophthalmologist so suspect doubt the uh, diagnosis of melanoma, and they, they then do the some imageology. So as you know, the malignant melanoma is very uh, famous for the high density in the city, even with the contrast media. So you can see tumor very easily in the right view. You uh, in the uh, left eye, there is a, a, a little bit so white, uh, high density so layer. It is very small and the thin thickness melanoma, but it is obvious from this CT uh, that even this thin tumor uh, cause very high density. And uh, many uh, ophthalmologists do also the, on the MRI examination into the image. Um, low density tumor is obvious. And uh, for the purpose of excluding um, the distant metastasis, the PET uh, examination will be performed very often. And in this patient, the tumor uh, accumulates FDG very avidly. Uh, but some very thin tumor, thin melanoma, cannot uh, uh, accumulate uh, the uh, FTG so avidly. So this is the latest version of the NCC guideline for the uber melanoma. And as you can see, the uh, treatment strategy is classified by the size of tumor. If the tumor is small, then black therapy, uh, black black therapy is indicated and also particle radiation therapy. And if the tumor is quite big, then the uh, particle beam radiation therapy as well as stereotactic radiation will be indicated. And the vision cannot be preserved anymore. On, on also the patient, if the patient has a pain, then uh, operative procedure in nucleation will be performed. But many patients uh, do not want to be, uh, to undergo this in nucleation, so they, choose the radiation therapy, even palliatively. And the status of UV melanoma in Japan is a little bit so different from the Caucasian or the Caucasian people. The UV melanoma is ultra super extremely rare disease. We see only 30 or 20 cases in all over in Japan in a year. That is 0.25 in a million population. Uh, in contrast, in Caucasian, we, uh, the report said that the 0 0.02 in uh, a million population is seen. So uh, we see uh, 24 times smaller uh, or, or less uh, patient than the Caucasian. Uh, and so reflecting this rareness, uh, Prague black therapy, uh, uh, yes, Prague black therapy is applied very often in this treatment of uber melanoma in European and American uh, uh, USA uh, using COMS iodide 1 to 5 and also lutetium 106. But in Japan, only lutetium 106 uh, is so uh, possible, and uh, this uh, black therapy is confined to only one institute, that is our hospital, National Cancer Center. And therefore, uh, very long waiting time 
is, is usual uh, because uh, by lutenium on the six we must also treat retinoblastoma or uh, retinoblastoma patients. So long waiting time is usual. So uh, it's not so good for the very rapidly growing melanoma. So many patients uh, would be uh, treated by the stereotactic radiation. And additionally, only one carbon therapy institute, well, carbon ion therapy institute is doing so orbital irradiation uh, because of the fixation problem. Uh, therefore, usually very long waiting time. So uh, because of these two circumstances, uh, we must irradiate the patient by cybernetic stereotactic radiation therapy because it is very cheap and covered by insurance very well. And the other melanoma is not only the local disease, but in many cases, it is metastasized very often to the liver and bone and so lung. That's a problem. And if once metastasis occurs, it is resistant to the immune checkpoint inhibitors and very hard to control. So this is management policy of in National Cancer Center Hospital. Uh, so the melanoma is mainly, the diagnosis of the melanoma is mainly so established by the clinical procedures, uh, fundoscopic and so on. And also the, if the nadi is suspected, then the ophthalmologist sees a patient, follow the patient very tightly, uh, closely. And if the rapid growth is seen, then they diagnose it as a melanoma. And uh, no biopsy is uh, so performed so often. Biopsy is performed not so often because of the vitreous body dissemination and so on. So we have no genetic examination. We have done not so often genetic examination of melanoma. So the melanoma is quite low, quite uh, small. Then they will undergo the lutetium therapy if all the circumstances permit. And not uh, if the patient has big tumor, not the, uh, the indication for the lutetium therapy, then the carbon ion radiation therapy or cyber knife will be performed. It, it depends upon the uh, uh, status of the carbon ion waiting time or so on. So the melanoma uh, staging is mainly by the size of tumor and this small suffix ABCD uh, 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 means whether serial body involvement or extrascular involvement is there. So uh, maybe the size of tumor determines the uh, uh, T, T stage. Uh, the iris melanoma also the same. Thing. And so this is radionuclide used in the ocular black, uh, ocular black therapy. We are using uh, exclusive this lutetium 106 because it emits on the beta ray and very confined range of pen penetration. So, but in Europe and the United States, IODA-25 is mainly used with a COMS applicator. So it emits a gamma ray, so it's the range of treatment is larger than the lutetium. So this uh, show the penetration of lutetium. This, this side is lutetium, right side is lutetium, left side, iodide one to five. You can see the iodide one to five can treat a little bigger tumor than the lutetium one. And if we consider lutetium, then it can treat only the uh, thickness of up to five millimeter. Uh, so this is applicator we had. It is very expensive one. And it is exclusively treated, uh, provided by German company. So East Germany has a very good performance and that, that attainment in the nuclear physics and nuclear chemistry. So they do exclusively, not East Germany, but in now, uh, now Germany can provide only this so lutetium 106 very, uh, very well. So because of the size of size of the, this applicator, the largest one is 25 millimeters. So we treat, uh, if we consider the margin of this black therapy, then we treat up to 16 centimeter, millimeter to tumor with this black therapy and less than five millimeter uh, thickness. This is how we apply the applicator. The applicator is a suture to the sclera and after the um, 
yes, this applicator is incited by the dissection of rectus muscles and uh, the suture to sclera. And after the uh, determined so time of application, uh, which can deliver 100 gray to the tumor tip, then the applicator will be removed. So tip of the melanoma in ruthenium therapy, we plan the radiation therapy to uh, uh, up to 100 gray. In the tumblastoma, we apply only 40 gray. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Next, we go to the cybernite. <coughs> 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 Take your time, Dr. Uh, Tom. Take uh, your time. Yes, I drink my. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, and uh, this is how we treated. Oh, <laughs> cyber knife. Um, uh, we have treated 90 patients in, in these five years, only very late tumor. So, uh, but one of it has a very uh, short uh, follow up time. So, uh, but the median, me, 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 median age was 63, and five patients had a recurrent tumor after ruthenium therapy and also proton therapy. And median wide or the size of tumor, diameter was 12 millimeter, and thickness was 6.3. And so median tumor disc distance was six millimeter, and we have very short follow-up time in median 25 or to almost two, uh, uh, more than two years. So this is stage and one patient has a ciliary body environment. Yes, these distributions. And this is cyber knife planning. It's a very core. And fractionation, we use uh, established, uh, we use very unified one and 48 gray in D95 in eight fractions. Uh, those six gray will be delivered every other day, not every day. And it corresponds to the uh, uh, equivalent dose in two gray. That means uh, if the 48 gray is calculated uh, to the uh, two gray fractional, uh, fractional dose gradation, with assuming uh, alpha beta value of 10 gray, then equivalent dose would be the 64 gray. But in melanoma is said to have a little bit lower alpha beta, beta value, six gray, then the equivalent dose with a two gray fraction would be 72 gray. And also this is a very big problem. We fix the patient scar by thermoplastic shell and eyes gazing at a marker during simulation and radiation therapy. And I will show the marker afterwards. Uh, treatment planning CT will be done with the eye, eyes open and closed in both positions and stress thickness is one millimeter. And GTV equals CTV, uh, but for the set, uh, settings PTV, we take two to four millimeter margins. It's a little bit greater one for the very small eyeball. So it would be a little bit uh, so controversial afterward. And those was prescribed as a D95 with isodope of 74 to 89%. And also that the second problem, we use the collimator uh, size from the 7.8 millimeter to 25 millimeter. We did not use five millimeter collimators because our thesis insists that the, in the five millimeter collimator, the uh, electron equi equilibrium, uh, the perpendicular to the beam axis cannot be established. So it's not so reliable. So they do not, uh, they hate, they hate to, uh, apply this five millimeter, very, very small collimator. I, I think it must be a little bit uh, reconsidered uh, afterward. And also fractional time range uh, in mean and uh, 25.6 minutes. It's a quite long. And so the patient would be radiated by this one. Oh, we have very, we have many these, so, uh, 
bus is our only chopsticks with a lead marker. The patient see during radiation these markers. It is quite easy way eh, to uh, fix eyeball, but during this long radiation time of 25 minutes, the patient blinks, and by the blinking, the eyeball goes upward, and so the melanoma can move away. So it's a problem. So because of that, we took the four millimeter margin. This is uh, uh, um, eye movement uh, disclosed by the metal marker uh, implanted to the sclera. Um, they saw the bifluorography, the movement of eyeball, then some eyeball will go up four millimeter or so. So we took the four millimeter PTB matching is a quite big. So this is typical planning for the posterior lying melanoma. The fortunately lens and also anterior structure did not get so much dose. And um, this is a tumor with serial body involvement. So because it uh, reaches to the anterior part, the lens and also serial body, very important position, got a very high dose. So this is the efficacy of cyber knife radiation therapy. How far up is not so long, but uh, one patient uh, uh, undergo enucleation, uh, underwent enucleation or the eyeball remover because of the painful neovascular uh, glaucoma. And the pathological examination of this patient disclosed recurrence. So this one patient with low recurrence enucleation is the same one. So only one uh, definite local recurrence was seen in this series, and distant metastasis occurs in five patients, and all the deaths uh, of five patients was due to this distant metastasis to the liver and the other lesions. And this is overall survival. Two year overall survival was almost 80% and three year uh, 90%. And this is distant metastasis and local recurrence. Or local recurrence only seen only one patient um, to, till now. Uh, yes, I, I must say that the, yes, in this series, uh, distant metastasis was seen within two years. But as a European and also American series have reported that distant metastasis of this uber melanoma can occur very late in their course. So the patient must be followed up further with uh, uh, examinations. Um, the T stage and distant metastasis has no quite clear relationships. And previous therapy, oh, only one local recurrence, so we cannot say any statistical, uh, we have no statistical power to say anything. And also previous therapy and distant metastasis, no good relation. Um, this is also another related with the controversial amount. And the uh, shrinkage of uber melanoma is very slow, as you can see. And this, uh, this patient with this arrow head, arrow, is so uh, enucleated one. It has so uh, shown the uh, persistent pathology or some recurrent pathology. And this patient, this, uh, some patient, uh, tumor grown up a little bit, but uh, our ophthalmologist determines that with a pandoscopic and other finding, this is only edema and some degenerative changes is there. So it's too early to uh, diagnose this growing tumor as a recurrence. So we they further follow up the patient. And the same trend was reported by other series. This is greatest one of the greatest series from Vienna University, uh, uh, which have treated this patient with cyber nine uh, and stereotactic radiation, and they do also reported very slow shrinkage of tumor and some tumor grown up a little bit temporarily. Afterwards, they shrunken, and so they, this very slow shrinkage is the um, uh, character of this uh, uber melanoma. And this is ultrasound examination of the uber melanoma. Um, before the treatment, the tumor uh, content is a little bit low echogenic, but after, uh, not so, we, we cannot so definitely say with this not so clear one, 
uh, but the, uh, after radiation therapy, internal structure will be a little bit more, uh, less, uh, less echogenic. So it is so not so bright. Uh, so it is a one point of follow up via ultrasound. Uh, but the, but the, the size itself has not changed so much. And um, this is fundoscopic finding, and this patient tumor has not regressed so much, but the, you can see the retinal vessel had deteriorated, or uh, some, um, uh, yes, no, any more, no more can be seen 23 months after radiation, and corresponding to it, the visual acuity lowered to 00 0.1 because of the retinal damage, but the tumor remains same, but some, degenerative change can be seen. So the ophthalmologist said this tumor is controlled. And also the follow-up was not so long because of the metastasis, but 10 months after radiation therapy, visual acuity remains uh, 0 0.8, almost stable, uh, and retinal vessel remains very good. Uh, but tumor, uh, a bit because of a vitreal blurring, it is very hard to see the uh, tumor by hand fundoscopic examination, but uh, no growth uh, could be seen. And so this is dosimetric parameters and the PTB uh, um, get them uh, prescribed dose almost. And yes, uh, somehow the anterior part or lens so, and so on uh, was irradiated a moderate dose to the moderate dose. Uh, so this is a dosimetric parameter shown in graph. And this is acute mobility within three months after cyber knife radiation therapy. Corneal erosion was seen in two patients, only grade one, with some uh, uh, foreign body feelings or so on, and conjunctiva in in injection grade one seen in one patient and dry eye in one patient because of a lacrimal gland, so exposure. And yes, I do not know why, but retinal breathing was seen in one patient as acute mobility and also retinal detachment. It is automatically classified to the grade C. It was also seen in one patient. So acute mobility is not so remarkable one. And um, rate mobility is uh, quite troublesome. And um, um, in this table, um, mobility more than grade two uh, are, are shown. And um, retinopathy is seen in nine patients because of the retina uh, radiation exposure. And if we follow the patient further, you know, we have followed up only two years in median, so cataract. Only one patient, but the, with a the further follow, follow up, the increase incidence will be increased. And vitreal opacity, also for patient. And a little bit troublesome one is neovascular glaucoma and also rubeosis, uh, which is caused by this anterior party radiation. And one patient uh, underwent uh, inucleation because of the painful neovascular glaucoma, which was not so controlled by medication. So this is how mobility occurs and retinopathy and all the uh, serious uh, mobility occurs within two, three years. But uh, I do not know further follow up uh, what we bring out. And this is change of visual acuity after cybernetic radiation. Uh, some patient uh, improves the uh, visual acuity, but many uh, patient uh, reduce in many patient visual acuity reduction was seen. So if the only the patient with the visual acuity more than zero point one is selected are selected, then uh, certain patient has a such visual acuity before cyber knife therapy, and out of these 30 patient, five patient, uh, in five patient, the visual acuity reduced to less than 0 0.1. And one patient lost the vision. And last visual acuity with less than 0 0.01 was seen in five patients, including one patient with inucleation. In and 
and definitely improved visual acuity was seen in one patient. So this is so those relationship between the retinopathy and eye dose, no clear relationship. Also vitreal opacity in, paper, in four patients, the, uh, we cannot say anything. Uh, neovascular glaucoma could be seen only two patients, so it, it, it's not so clear relationships. So BJ activity less than 0.01 has no um, definite relationships with the optic nerve dose. So there cannot be seen any definite uh, so those uh, effect relationship because uh, uh, partly because of the low number of patients and low, uh, low number of events. So tremendously great number of patients was treated uh, uh, in uh, so Vienna and also so uh, Turkey and so in other European countries and. So this is cybernafsiris, also the linear core cybernafsiris, stereotactic radiation. And in this little melanoma, most, in, in, most important ones, how we fix the uh, eyeball. Uh, the, how, uh, the good uh, fixation, uh, with a good fixation, we can reduce the margin of CTV, CTV effectivity. So we took the, uh, in our series, we took four millimeter mostly. It's a great one. So with a great, this great, so margin, retina can get very great dose or is a large uh, wide portion of the retina can get great dose that will cause a reduction of visual acuity. So in, in this Yazisi series, they did use periorbital anesthesia to fix the eyeball and they used very low margins. Uh, but the enucleation so instance is so high. Yes, that's a, a very big problem. And so uh, in comparison to our cities, they use a very higher dose than us. And the control rate is uh, fortunately more than 80% and more nearly 90%. And this uh, very early cities is from our previous series we used at that time only linear accelerator and the same fraction uh, are now also employed by us. So, but uh, our series has almost same so result with other one, but we do not know with further follow up with fat will occur. So this is a proton series and proton series is, um, and this is so Paul Scherer Institute from Switzerland. They treated 2,400, uh, that is we, to reach this level, we do need 100 years. And also Harvard, they did treat very well. And in average local control is more than 90. It seemed to be a little bit better than stereotactic radiation. But they did use all the, almost in, inclusively, almost exclusively, the, metallic murmur, that must be surgically implanted beforehand. And yes, and they did use some very specialized so instrument to see the monitor the eye movement during therapy. So they did use the two point, mainly 2.5 millimeter, so margins. And also some a little bit larger doses than our series. And the inucleation rate is a little bit smaller, uh, uh, but same. It, it is not so marginally, not so greatly different from the cyber knife or linear series. So the problem is how we treat, how we fix the eyeball movement. Then if we can effectively fix the eyeball movement and PTV, CTV margin is smaller, then we can get a good dose, a good result with cyber knife or X-ray. So stereotactic fractional irradiation is very effective. And they cannot receive any dose mobility relationships. And to reduce the mobility, fixation of eye must be improved. With the reduction of GPTV, similar result with proton or heavy ion are so expected. In this part, the total load is lower than other cities, but we get the same local control. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Excellent. 
thank you, Dr. Yutami. Um, no, doctor, yes, thank you. this is one of the more challenging diseases we treat in the head, brain and head and neck with radiation. And uh, your experience is notable, and especially in a place like Japan where there's not so many cases. So um, I would invite the audience to uh, you know, key in their questions. You are a QA function, Q and A function at the bottom of the screen. Yes. And, and I'm gonna start with my, uh, some questions uh, from the audience and some from myself. Um, and so uh, there was a question here. It said, would you comment on the greater than 90% local yes. control rate at 12 years from proton therapy? So UCSF apparently, I, I'm unaware of this, is cited as uh, promoting its proton therapy program as having a greater than 98% local control. Um, if so, then it is suggested that the CyberKnife outcomes here are inferior. Would you care to comment? Sure. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, I have no objection to it. Yes. To, to, pre, to, to the present time, this protons and also heavy ion therapy has brought better results than the X-ray uh, stereotactic radiation, as I have shown in the tables. And this is because there's uh, the sharp dose distribution and also the, I think the fixation of eyes. They do the all, always, almost always a metallic matter implantation and they see the eye movement very precisely by the video monitoring. But in all cities, except the Rotterdam, the, the cyber knife or the X-ray therapy did not use such very complicated or very expensive fixation and monitoring. So if we do, we, we can so do this, some improvement of this fixation and shrinkage of PTV. And then uh, if we uh, do the, some sophisticated planning, then I think some comparable result can be obtained. I, I hope so. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure, but, but yes, but till present, yes, I have no objection that Proton has brought uh, the better result than the stereotactic radiation. So basically fixation, eye fixation is very important in your eyes. Sure, and also how, 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 we, how, we, uh, how we follow the pursue the movement of eye. Gotcha. That's a very important. Someone asked, uh, why are the CT scans with eyes closed and open are required for the treatment. So why okay. do you close the CT? Why do you close with the CT scan for treatment planning and then open for treatment? Yes, that that's because we use only very cheap and very easy method, gazing the lead marker as I, I show in the slide. And uh, but the patient cannot uh, remain all the time I open. The patient blinks and at that blinking the eyeball grow, uh, eyeball goes up. So well, these two status must be so fused in the treatment planning. So okay. also that is the call. Yes, that, that is, I think it is ITV, yes. And also we do, we do add some uh, margins, four millimeter for this ITV. So it is quite bigger than uh, usual one. So it's a problem. Now, those are exceptionally large margins, but maybe that's what's needed here. So sure. someone asked, have you ever treated two synchronous lesions, two, two lesions uh, occurring in the same eye at the same no. time, and adjacent to each other? And then, uh, yes, only one, but they, they had very, the, the two lesions uh, lay in the very vicinity, not so greatly separated. So we did treat it the once irradiation, but it is almost one tumor, very so tightly so connected. So it was two, two, twin tumor, but so not so greatly separated each other. So this next question is one that I was gonna ask you, but I think it's an important one. Would you comment about single fraction treatments? Mm -hmm. What are your what you're thinking about single fraction, and yes. why are you advocating fractionated here? Uh -huh. Yes, beforehand, uh, uh, when we have no cyber knife, also the in Japan, not but there are many reports of the gamma knife one time irradiation. They have shown the very also good result, but the we 
as a radiation oncologist, we are always fearing about the chronic or the late uh, mobilities by the one fraction. So uh, we prefer to do fractionated irradiation. So uh, with the fractionation, we can avoid uh, some late mobility also. But there okay. is also a report of the one fraction of the irradiation. So, you know, I'm, I'm my good friend, uh, Alex Milosevic in Munich, uh, he's had a very successful program treating many hundreds, maybe even more than 500 patients mm -hmm. with uveal melanoma with mm -hmm. a single fraction. And mm -hmm. He believes in it because um, what he's managed to do is to paralyze the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. With the eye paralyzed, he then uh, does the... Um, uh. the Imaging, yes. quickly does treatment planning mm -hmm. and then does treatment all in the span of like mm -hmm. two or three hours with mm -hmm. the paralyzed eye. Mm -hmm. so, yes. You're familiar also with the, his work, I'm sure. Yes, sure. Yes, in a, also that Turkish people, Turkish doctors are doing the a paralyzed eyeball to make the fractional irradiation, but they do, they did, they do the three fractional irradiation at the, every, every fraction they do the anesthetize. So uh, we do not prefer to call our anesthetologist every time. So we do only the very f easy fixation, but uh, it must be improved, I think. I understand. And we neurosurgeons, we love that you put anesthesiologists to work. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to know about visual preservation and actually just complications with respect to tumor size. Is there, was there any correlation between tumor size, tumor location, and the complication profile? Yes, yes, sure. The, if, the, if the tumor is already encroaching to the optic nerve or the fovea, uh, other than initiations, and they have the already some disturbed visual acuity or reduced visual acuity. So we exclude that patient with very poor visual acuity from the uh, yeah from the statistics. Uh, but yes, the big tumor or the tumor approaching to the fovea uh, can cause a disturbance of this visual acuity from the very initiation of the cyberknife. In these cases, it's very hard to keep the visual acuity even with protons. How about if the tumor is not next to the fovea? As it does, yes. uh, complications correlate with tumor size. Can be, but we have not uh, we have not uh, seen in our city, our, in our very small city, it cannot be seen. Okay. So what would you propose is a better optic visual fixation solution. You, you <laughs> comment that you must use four millimeters to get away from the four millimeters to use yes. less margin. Yes. What, what sort of method would you recommend? Yes, that the first one said, we, we, yes, if we, we, if we use some very complicated, so uh, eyeball monitoring systems, and then we must set to the very big, uh, video machine, which will prevent the, uh, which will prevent the beam arrangement, the very big, big so uh, instrument uh, in front of the scalp, in front of the face. Then it will disturb the entrance of X-rays. But with proton, they can do it. Yes, as you know, it has a the black peak, and before over black peak, there could not be say any radiation. So, but we, we, if we use further the cyber knife or the X-rays and the big instrument to monitor the eyeball movement is impossible. So, we, we, I would like to improve one by keeping the eye during radiation open. That, that is why we would like to use some speculum or something like it, and also some anesthetized, eye, not anesthetized eyeball, but anesthetized cornea. And first we would like to uh, go with that one uh, and see the, how eyeball moves. Well, that is easy, easy step. Yeah, well, I mean, it's easier for places where they treat hundreds of patients and. In Japan, where you don't have so many patients, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to justify that type of investment, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, um, would you ever consider doing single fraction radio surgery or single fraction treatments for these tumors? And if so, <laughs> when and where? Uh, 
for, for this tumor sign, no, no, for lung cancer, I did use the, for the first time in the world, or that uh, second in the world, the one time uh -huh. irradiation. <laughs> but in this, so very, there are many sensitive so, tissues around okay. the tumor. So I would like to prefer to fractionate one. I understand. Well, Dr. Atami, thank you very much. Uh, this was a, a fascinating lecture. Thank um, you. I've, I learned a lot, and I'm sure others in the audience learned as well. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, we think the ZAPX is going to be a, a brilliant solution for many sure, of these patients. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I hope that. The, yes. the, VAX, the ZAPX, by virtue of its beam energy and its collimation, yes. has a particularly sharp uh, steep dose gradient, and we think sure. it'll be particularly useful for cases such as those that Dr. Tommy showed us here. Today. Yes, thank you. Brilliant, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our future Thursday uh, webinar series. So um, everyone, uh, okay. okay. Bye. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.